Hello everybody, welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today we're going to be talking about social intelligence, more specifically how we can enhance it through psychology. Now, doing the research for social intelligence, I learned a lot. And I think one of the main things I've learned is that social intelligence encompasses every other aspect of intelligence. Not only the intelligence, but also every sort of in internal state that you assume, your mental states, such as um, your morals, your virtue, your personality, your temperament, your hobbies, your knowledge, your skill set, whatever you use to exude and exhibit to the outside world, specifically within the form of communication, is actually a form of social intelligence. You can even use your mathematical skills in a way in which enhances your social status. It's really interesting how social intelligence works, and I'm really excited for you guys to learn the importance of it. So, what exactly is social intelligence? So the best way to define social intelligence is that social intelligence is the comprehension, judgment, understanding, and interpretation of other people's mental states while in accordance being able to communicate with them in an effective way. That's sort of the most abstract and um, all-encompassing definition of it. So I like to ask the question, why should we increase it? Why are you watching this video in the first place? What value can you gain from increasing your social intelligence? Well, I think this is important to learn and understand because if you know your why within a certain framework, you'll be more likely to memorize it and then apply it, recall it, because your brain will understand the value of what you're learning. And so for social intelligence, I'm going to ask you a few questions. Do you want power? Do you want influence? Do you want more friends? Do you want more opportunities? Do you want to be in more positions of success? Do you want to be more happier in life? Do you want to cultivate deeper and more meaningful relationships? If you said yes to any of those things, then the enhancement of social status, of social intelligence will certainly give you those things. So the way this video is structured is like this. We're first going to talk about social status and its importance. And social status is sort of like the end result of our social intelligence. So it's important to learn. And then we're going to talk about the four pathways that human beings have taken over the last 100 years to attain that social status. And lastly, we're going to decompose social intelligence to its core origin so we can better conceptualize how it's applied and how it's exhibited so we can formulate practical strategies to better ourselves within the domain of social intelligence. Okay, let's get into the crux of the video. The American Psychological Association did a meta-analysis over the last 100 years analyzing how human beings have attained social status. They were able to come up with four different pathways that human beings have taken, and they're all quite distinct and relevant to social intelligence. Now, first we should define what social status exactly is. So I said social status was the end result of, our, of you know social intelligence, but there's actually a better way to define it in which this study does. So social status is the willingness, or sorry, social status is the extension to which people give you admiring respect and voluntary deference. So there's a key phrase there that we have to learn, that we have to uh, sit with, which is voluntary deference. Make sure you understand this phrase because voluntary deference is the crux of what we're going to look to attain in order to be socially competent. So voluntary deference is when people comply to and adhere to your wishes, desires, inclinations, and suggestions without the use of force, intimidation, coercion, and without using ill-mannered techniques. It's a deference in a natural and positive way where the other human being is fully autonomous of their decision to follow you or to join your side in some way. It's a voluntary um, form of friendship, relationships or subordination, whatever framework of relationships there are. But it's basically this genuine connection with the other and willingness to defer to them. That is what we're looking to create with social intelligence. Okay, so what are the four pathways to attain social status? The first path is known as the dominance path. People that take the dominance path are physically imposing. They're very assertive. They're dominant. They're strong-willed. They're commanding. They take up a lot of you know, room with their aura or their um, physical features. And they have this 
capacity, not necessarily willingness, but this capacity to inflict harm on people. And sometimes they do have the willingness to do so. But more importantly, the people around them, they have this sort of subconscious thought or conscious thought that these people can harm them in some sort of way. So there's this sort of fear. And this causes the the other people to defer to them or to um, just allow them to be them while they take a back seat. And to be quite frank with you, the dominance path is the worst possible path. It actually only leads to status and attention. It does not lead to respect, popularity, um, and voluntary deference. It only leads to attention and status, which is not what we're looking for. What we're going to shoot for is much more sophisticated, elegant, and adroit way of attaining social status, which the next path completely exudes. So the next path is, com- is known as the competence path. Patrick Jane from The Mentalist, if some of you may know, he embodies his path probably the best I've ever seen. So the competence path is made up of two different sort of definitions. Number one is your cognition or how knowledgeable or skilled you are within a given field. Number two is your extroversion, specifically your leadership ability and your conversational skills. Both go hand to hand. Okay, so this is interesting because you attain social status via ability. You attain social status using your internal gifts and people see this. They see that tangibly and they're like, wow, they they sort of um, conceptualize the idea of, hey, this person is really good at what they do. If I stick with them, good things will happen. They're sort of infatuated with how good you are. They're infatuated with your process, how you get results, how you problem solve. They're, they're drawn to your skill and your internal competencies. So that could be being really good at detective work in Patrick Jane's case. But there actually is a few problems with just the competence path specifically. And that is this. If you're trying to convey to somebody that you're really good at a certain thing, but you're not, you're not enacting it out for them. You're not doing it within the field of your given ability. And then it's not as effective as actually being there, right? Because imagine if I came up to you and I was like, hey, so I'm really good at catching debit card thieves. What would you even make of that? You wouldn't really, you wouldn't really resonate with that. You wouldn't really find that, in, you wouldn't find that impressive at all, maybe. But if I actually did it for you, in front of you, things would be different. And the second problem is, if you're trying to use verbiage to display your polished and refined skills, well, that can come across as braggadocious. And we're not looking to be braggadocious because being braggadocious completely contradicts social intelligence. And so that's a problem within the competence path. However, the second aspect of the competence path alleviates some of these problems. Remember, the second path is extroversion, specifically leadership ability and conversational skills. So you not only have the God-given ability, you're not only adroit at what you do, but you now have the ability to leverage it, to advertise it in a way that's more human and more conducive to morale and team success. You're more instrumental to human success, right? You're not this robotic machine that just gets their job done in a very efficient manner. No. You're much more than that. You have the social skills to sort of domineer any situation. Now, a great example of why extroversion within the competence path is crucial is like this. So Patrick Jane, right? We all know who that is. We all know who Sherlock Holmes is. They're two of the greatest detectives of all time. Both exemplify deduction, emotional intelligence, reasoning, thinking, these sort of cognitive feats that are impossible for normal humans to attain and to exemplify. But these two are great at it. However, Patrick Jane is more socially attractive. He's more socially sought after. Now, why is that? Why do you think he's more, why do you think he's higher on the social ladder than Sherlock Holmes? It's because he has the extroversion. He has the social skills, the conversational skills, and the leadership ability to leverage that cognition. Where Sherlock Holmes certainly has that to a certain extent, but not to Patrick Jane's level. And so the competence path is quite a powerful path to take. And it's it can be quite conducive to attaining social status.
Now, imagine if you can meticulously carve out a way to associate your cognitive abilities within a social situation. Think about how powerful that would be. Think about what you could do, what you could accomplish with that. The possibilities are endless. Okay, on to the third path, which is known as the virtue path. Those in the virtue path exhibit this, um, characteristics of being virtuous, such as generosity, humility, how unselfish you are. And so they use these characteristics to elicit feelings of warmth within other people. And you gain social status via your character, via the upholding of moral ideals and values. And you're not just a decent human being. You don't just conform to what you're supposed to do. You don't just follow the norms. No, you're uberly unselfish. You're one of the highest in selflessness that there is. And they utilize this thing known as benevolent altruism. So benevolence refers to the preservation and welfare of your direct group, how much you impact those two things. And you do, and so that would be like, okay, sacrificing for people, helping people, doing what's in for their best interest. That's sort of an example of being benevolent. But there's, there's a second aspect to the virtue path, which is known as universal altruism. So not only are you a class A character within your direct group, not only are you this righteous individual that does the best for the group, but you actually display these characteristics, these moral characteristics within the outside world as well. And so I think the psychology behind this is that people not only see an example of you being you know, a genuine good person to them, but they see that you're like this within all different areas of life with other people, with other events and situations, which I think is powerful. And this path, I think, has the highest potential because being virtuous is so powerful. It's charismatic and it's captivating. It gives people hope, it inspires them, and it allows them to be themselves which allows them to flourish, which allows the entire group to flourish and bloom into um, whatever their goals were in the first place. And so it's quite instrumental to success and social success. Marcus Aurelius, the great Stoic emperor, who I would argue is the greatest Roman emperor of all time, he embodied the virtue path, probably the best I've ever seen. He was a paragon of virtue. His success, the betterment of everyone in Rome, their prosperity, his very nature was on the basis of virtue. Everything he accomplished was because of his virtuous characteristics. And so I think that's amazing. Okay, so the fourth and final path is known as the micropolitics path. And this path is by far the most compelling and I think the most controversial. And you'll see what I mean by that. Those in the micropolitics path look to convince others that they possess the attributes, abilities, competencies, virtues that is instrumental to the collective like-mindedness of the group and for the group's success. Did you see the key word there? Convince, meaning they don't actually have to possess it. So since the people on the micropolitics path aim to convince others that they possess these inherent qualities, they can certainly engage in deceptive techniques, social chicanery, which can seem quite mendacious, and because they feign these qualities to others because they don't, they don't care about what they do. They care about how they do it. It's all about the system and they themselves are the system and they look to enhance that to the best of their ability. So they're actually able to quantify the three main attributes that go within the micropolitics path. So number one is extroversion. Remember extroversion in this um, study is known as leadership ability and conversational skills. But there's a third element that's attached to this now, which is your persuasion, your ability to persuade others, which is obviously key in convincing. The second attribute is assertiveness, your confidence, your dominance, how strong-willed you are, how commanding you are. And it's interesting because obviously the first element, which was extroversion, is straight from the competence path, and assertiveness is from the dominance path. So the micropolitics path is sort of like a fusion of all the paths. But right, so assertiveness is important within the micropolitics path because you need to be confident. You need to showcase that 
you are the ability that you look to exude. And this also hints upon conviction bias. So the people in the micropolitics path, they don't obviously consciously, they're not consciously like, oh, I'm going to exploit conviction bias. But conviction bias is a part of this because the more confident you are at something, the more likely people are to believe it. And then the third and final attribute is individual to the micropolitics path, which is known as self-monitoring. Self-monitoring is this hyper self-awareness. It's this hyper sense of self, this amazing and uh, judicial sense of self. You're very cogent with how you go about how you present yourself, essentially. And you have this amazing knack to present yourself in a way that is quite valuable, that is charming, that is charismatic, that is uh, glamorous in some sort of way. And you not only have this hyper self-awareness, but you have this shrewd sense of other beings and how and what they value, which combine the two, and it's quite a powerful path to take when you have the high self-awareness and the high understanding of human nature. Now, the next aspect of this video is going to be breaking down social intelligence to its core, subcategorizing it so we understand it much better. And we're going to do a quick thought experiment with this too. Every definition that I give about social intelligence, I want you guys to rate yourself 1 through 10. Because we need to have a genuine self-appraisal about what about how good we are within social intelligence so we know what to enhance, so we know what to work on. And this will be quite beneficial. Okay, so let's begin with the first definition of social intelligence, the, sort of the first sub-definition, which is self-management. Self-management is how well you can manage your own thoughts, behaviors, emotions, mental works, whatever internal motivators and drivers you have in accordance to your social goals and to whatever you want to accomplish. So it's not only managing your own self, but it's doing it in accordance to the goal that you want to accomplish, which is important. If you are sagacious with your self-management, you can literally acquire and enhance any social quality that's out there. You can become more charismatic. You can become a better listener. You can become more sophisticated. Hell, you can become more surreptitious if you wanted to. More mysterious. Whatever you want. If you have a high enough self-management. Okay, make sure you're rating yourself 1 through 10 as I list off these different definitions. Okay, so the second aspect of social intelligence is known as self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is making proper and cogent judgments about oneself. How well you can gauge your own abilities and how well you can set realistic goals. It's how well you can predict and have this clairvoyance of how you'll act in future situations that can vary in complexity. And it's how well you can cope with emotions. So having a, a strong self-efficacy allows you to be realistic. It allows you to be logical in your social approach. It allows you to actually accomplish your goals practically and with a sober mindset. So you can actually use self-efficacy in a very strategic manner. You can actually break it down into sort of like a step-by-step -step process. So for me, I'm not very funny. When I jest, some people either think I'm being too serious or I'm not serious at all. It's actually a, quite a funny dichotomy. But to some people, I'm like the funniest guy. But to most people, I'm pretty dry and bland with my humor. But anyways, I have the self-efficacy to understand that I can't use humor to leverage my main qualities of what I want to accomplish. I leverage things like dramatism, charisma, intense focus, um... Those are the articulation. That's what I leverage. I have an understanding that, hey, maybe humor isn't the way to go about social attainment. And so it's important to discern what you're good at and what you're not good at. So let's say that you want to be more sophisticated, right? And so you gauge your own level of sophistication and you're like, okay, you know what? I could be more knowledgeable. Maybe I should pick up more hobbies. Maybe I should be, maybe I should make less judgments and I should remain neutral and more um, dilemmas about things. Maybe I should suspend my judgment altogether and make people and let people think what they want to think. So there are tons of ways to add to your level of sophistication. And let's say you come up with, you know, a plan for yourself. And the next step would be to sort of have this clairvoyance of how you would act with this new set of knowledge that you're going to attain in the first place. And then all of a sudden you enact that and you sort of uh, differentiate if that works for you or not. It's like the scientific method almost. Okay, the third aspect of social intelligence known as 
social awareness. Social awareness is how well you can conceptualize, understand, and empathize with diverse backgrounds, cultures, contexts, and how well you can sort of um, comprehend and assimilate different types of people in different con- in different contexts. And they're actually able to quantify the methodologies in which they use to ascertain the ability of social awareness, which is if you have a high propensity to compliment somebody when they accomplish something, you have high social awareness. If you're able to disagree with somebody, but also genuinely listen to their point of view, you have high social awareness. And if you're able to sort of understand and conceptualize different and diverse backgrounds and you're able to recall those things, you have high social awareness. So the fourth aspect of social intelligence is on a social memory. And this is something that I like to utilize a lot because I I see it as very valuable. And I think it's very important to my personal skills of social intelligence. So social memory is being able to recall and store objectively given information, but more specifically, social stimulation. And this is known as like, Remembering names, faces, verbiage, nonverbal behavior, important details, events, any sort of attributes, characteristics, morals of the other individual, any important details about the individual. And why is this such an important aspect of social intelligence? You're probably thinking it's just memory. Well, think about this. Having a high level of social memory allows you to layer on each level of meeting that you have with the individual. It allows you to build rapport. It allows you to deepen the connection with somebody after every meetup, which is extremely powerful. And there's so many different strategies you can utilize. For example, imagine being able to remember a specific detail about somebody and then thinking about that detail and then explaining it to the other person. I've done this so many different times and most people are very um, enamored and actually endeared by such a thing. Let's move on to the next aspect of social intelligence, which is known as social flexibility. Social flexibility is how well you can produce as many and or diverse solutions to social problems or circumstances. When you do succeed in social flexibility, it can really augment you up the social ladder. Because when you do solve a social problem, when you do accomplish a social goal, because social flexibility, I think, has the most correlation to like tangible social success because you're quite literally exemplifying a task or a process that allows you to accomplish something that another person wanted you to accomplish, right? People want their problems solved. And if you can solve that, all of a sudden, you're climbing the ranks of social status. The last two definitions of social intelligence is social understanding and social perception. And these two are actually the most correlated with your intelligence and the most malleable. You're actually able to progress in these categories the more experience and the more knowledge you have within social situations. So let's begin with social understanding. Social understanding is basically how well you can understand social stimuli. So for example, it's like being able to understand the mental states of war of when people speak their verbiage. It's being able to decode social cues. It's being able to understand social behavior. It's being able to understand the why in objectively given social stimulation. And social understanding, I would argue, is the crux of social intelligence. I mean, like I said, it doesn't exist without social understanding. But this allows me to segue to social perception because social understanding and social perception are intertwined. You cannot have one without the other. And I'll explain why. So we got social understanding for the most part. It's sort of the why behind observed behavior. It's sort of the why behind different social stimulation. Now, social perception is just the pure observation of the objectively given information. It's how well you can observe and analyze what's actually going on in front of you. There's no interpretation within social perception. It's just the observation of it. So this is a great, this is a great example of how you can sort of distinguish between the two and why the two are go hand in hand. Now, imagine you have three friends. If you don't have friends, imagine fictional characters, okay? We'll use Patrick Jane, Hannibal Lecter, and Sherlock Holmes, for our example. Okay. You're observing these three in a social environment, right? Pick any social environment. Let's say they're at a social gathering. It's, it's Hannibal Lecter's 
he, Hannibal Lecter invited everybody for a dinner party, okay? And the three of them are talking together. Imagine that conversation. Okay. Patrick Jane. You're observing this, by the way. Patrick Jane tells a joke. And Hannibal Lecter laughs at the joke. But Hannibal Lecter, when he looks away, his smile is still there. But it dissuades in a natural way. It diminishes naturally. Sherlock Holmes also laughs at Patrick Jane's joke. But when he looks away, his smile fades abruptly. It's not natural at all. And then for the next 10 seconds, he's just staring at the wall with a very bland and fixated facial expression. Okay, so what did you observe there? You observed that Patrick Jane told a joke, Hannibal Lecter laughed at the joke, looked away, and his smile faded naturally. You also observed Sherlock Holmes laughed at Patrick Jane's joke, but when he looked away, his smile faded abruptly, and then he stood, he stared and fixated it at a wall for the next 10 seconds with a bland facial expression. What I just listed there is the social perception. Those are the, that's the objectively given information. Now, the social understanding would be like this. This is now we can have some fun and interpret what we just saw. So the social understanding would be like this. Okay. So we can tell about Patrick Jane. He told a joke. Okay. Why did he tell a joke? Well, he has an inclination to tell jokes. He likes using comedy. He likes to jest. And we can also indicate that he's having fun in the social gathering because why are you telling a joke in the first place? You're more, you're more likely to tell a joke if you're having fun in the given environment. So that's what that tells us about Patrick Jane. Also tells us that he enjoys the company of Hannibal and Sherlock to tell them a joke. Okay. So what does this tell about, what does this say about Hannibal Lecter? Okay, Hannibal Lecter laughed at the joke. So that tells us that he likes Patrick Jane or he wants Patrick Jane to think that he's seen. And we can tell that Hannibal Lecter actually thought it was funny because when he looked away, he was still smiling, indicating that he's still thinking about the joke. And his smile faded away in an abrupt or sorry, in a natural manner. So that means that he thought the joke was actually funny. And that also means that he's enjoying himself in the situation because he was just laughing. Okay, Sherlock Holmes, he laughs at the joke, but when he looks away, his smile fades abruptly. And then he stares at a wall for 10 seconds, indicating what? So first, he did laugh at the joke, but he didn't think it was funny because his smile faded abruptly. So maybe Sherlock Holmes just wanted to maintain social congruency with Patrick, or he wanted to make sure Patrick wasn't disparaged by Sherlock not laughing at the joke. So he still va- so we can say that Sherlock still values Patrick Jane in some sort of way, but he didn't find the joke funny. Or maybe, more importantly, he's not enjoying himself in the social circumstance. And so that example, you can sort of see how social perception and social understanding intertwine as one. The true secret of social intelligence is being able to understand your own strengths. You can literally leverage anything within any field, within any domain, in any environment. And if it's communicated effectively and the other person values it or they see it interesting, they find it alluring, they find it seductive, enticing, they find it valuable in some sort of way, that's social intelligence. And so what works for me may not work for you. What works for you may not work for me. It's all subjective in that sense. But at the end of the day, we're trying to produce voluntary deference. But how we produce it can vary. And that's a beautiful thing. And so you have to have the self-efficacy, the self-management, the social understanding to determine that for yourself. So at the end of the day, figure it out, learn more about yourself, investigate who you are as a person, and then leverage your abilities to the world.